Hi. Welcome to Math with Marty. Um, I'm sure you're all wondering how the Math with Marty peace plan for the Middle East is coming along. We'd like to give you an update, but although it's been two weeks since we first aired the peace plan, it is only, as we record this show, less than 24 hours after it was uh, first aired. So it's not possible to give you any more information than we told you last week, which was that uh, um, some of the Palestinians down at the university wanted some time to look over the video cassette before they, uh, before they were felt they would be ready to come on the show and discuss it, discuss it live. So uh, uh, the only other thing I thought we might do is for those who were unfortunate enough to miss the peace plan when it did air, we would very briefly just review the, the essential elements, which consisted of uh, an attempt to give a, a land for peace uh, formulation whereby we uh, we suggested um, a Palestinian state of which we generously on behalf of Syria donated the Golan Heights on behalf of Israel we donated part of the northern Galilee we give them half Jerusalem and in return for our generosity in giving up the Galilee we asked them to give us the Gaza Strip which is a rather undesirable piece of territory down at this end, uh, leading to uh, uh, what we thought might possibly be uh, two acceptable countries, one for uh, them and one for us, uh, as we uh, like to like to think of it. <laughs> um, was I invertly point pointing to the sea when I said us? Or no, 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 no. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> Now, uh, and we discussed uh, the desirability of at least a certain degree of population transfer to achieve more ethnically homogeneous states. And uh, we hope that uh, this might uh, touch off some, some discussion. And uh, we will keep you up to date on uh, the peace plan as events permit. But uh, first things first, now to get to something really important. I asked our viewers uh, last week to consider whether uh, they could show how it transpires that a Mercator projection of the world, which is one of the common map projections, that's the one where Greenland looks as big as South America. And why would anyone use a silly uh, system of mapping the Earth like that? Because the Mercator projection has one very desirable property in that shapes are locally preserved. Um, shapes being preserved means angles are preserved. It means if you draw a line at 45 degrees across the Mercator projection of the world, that uh, that line is going northeast. Uh, and you can count on it. Whereas some of the other projections in the world, which do a better job of keeping things in their proper size, do so by sort of twisting things over in such a way that you don't quite know what direction things are pointing in. So it is the preservation of shapes which distinguishes the Mercator projection. And I asked if we could show that this property arose from a simple geometric construction of the Mer Mercator projection, which is, I suggested, you take the globe, you take the Earth, and wrap it in a cylinder, which touches touches the Earth at the equator. You wrap it in a cylinder. And then, taking a point of light at the center of the Earth, project from this point of light through the Earth to the cylinder and we map the point on this surface of the Earth where the ray of light passes through to the cylinder. And I suggested that this was the geometrical construction of the Mercator projection. And I asked if we could, uh, is it clear yeah. how it's constructed? Thanks. 
And I asked if we could uh, show that this construction did indeed lead to a preservation of shapes. And in the few minutes uh, between the conclusion of last week's show and the commencing of the recording this show, I have experienced serious reservations about uh, whether, I've, uh, whether I got the right idea on this at all. And let's see if we can uh, uh, see what's going on here. Well, for, first of all, uh, would it be shown to us by cutting the cylinder and unfolding it on the page? Is that how we would see it? I don't think I've seen such a map. It's just a projection. Mercator projection? Yeah. It's like in grade three on your classroom wall. It was a big map where Greenland was as big as South America. That was the Mercator projection. So like, was it a rectangle? A rectangle, yeah. It comes out as a rectangle. That's right. You cut the cylinder and un unroll it. Okay. So you never really get to see the pole. You never get to see the pole. Away. The poles just recede indefinitely, no, as I they would. I had that in my deprived grade three class. Anyway. Like every map of the world, it sort of has the Arctic Circle somewhere. The Arctic Circle, but that's a long way from the poles. Yeah, the Arctic right. Circle is only 67 degrees north or something like that. Um, no, it's hard to get to the poles. I mean, Antarctica, all you see of Antarctica on the bottom of the map is a long coastline like this, right? Mm -hmm. But, I mean, it's a moot point how far down the South Pole is, right? Mm -hmm. Now... Do you think uh, we should uh, pick up the thread of the, the mathematical uh, topic now? Sure. Let us see. We can take the Earth to be approximately 24,000 miles in circumference. So it's clear that the cylinder around the Earth is 24,000 miles, 24,000 miles around. Now, what I want to consider is um, I'll take the easiest possible point I can take, which is, which is uh, um, the 60th latitude. Now, the 60th latitude is distinguished by the fact that the cosine of 60 is one half. Cosine of 60 degrees is one half. Now, here's your 60th parallel. It's quite a northerly parallel. But since the cosine of 60 degrees is one half, What it means is if it's 12,000 miles, uh, 24,000 miles to get around the Earth at the equator, then it's only, it's only uh, 12,000 miles to get around the Earth at the 60th parallel. Is that uh, evident? You see, it's okay. a lot shorter around over here than it is to get around here. It's half as short. And yet, because the cylinder does not get smaller, this 60th parallel, when it's mapped onto the cylinder, is uh, still the full 24,000 miles long. So here's the 60th parallel on the Mercator projection. And it is, in fact, twice as long as it ought to be. Twice as long as it ought to be. Now, in order that shapes would retain their same shape and that directions would be preserved, we should have that if lateral distances are stretched by a factor of two, then vertical distances should also be stretched by a factor of two. And we would like to carefully uh, investigate whether this does happen. So let's look at it. Let's look at it. What is bothering me here? is if I take, uh, what is there? Uh, from here to here is uh, 6,000 miles, which we divide into 90 degrees. So it's basically 66 miles per degree of latitude. In other words, there's the 49th parallel. Winnipeg is on the 50th parallel, so we're approximately 66 miles from the border. Now, so let's take, here's the 60th parallel, and I want to say we go to the 61st parallel, and it's about 66 miles. Notice, of course, that if we go from the equator to the first degree of latitude, that 
The distance here represents 66 miles and it's a direct projection. So if the Mercator projection is going to keep shapes preserved, and we've said that at the 60th degree, lateral distances are doubled, then we should have our vertical distances also being doubled. So let's see what happens to this one degree of latitude in relation to what happened to the one degree of latitude near the equator. And what is bothering me is, I'm going to take a ray started at the center of the Earth, project it through the 61st latitude, and these rays are diverging. They're diverging, and look, by the time they get here, they're already twice as far apart as they started out. You see here, they started out 66 miles apart. Well, they were here only 66 miles apart, but since they're diverging from zero to 66, by the time they get here, they're 132 miles apart. And that's not the worst of it, because they still got to spread out. They got to lay across the surface, which is multiplied by, it's a 60 degree angle there, approximately, so you've got to give it another factor of two for one over the cosine of 60 degrees. So I've got that the distance from here to here is four times 66. Four times 66, where the distance here was 66 miles. And so I've got my lateral distances, my vertical distance here being amplified by a factor of four whereas my lateral distances was only amplified by a factor of two. So I don't appear to be getting the preservation of shape. And I was, you know, I really thought that I had the right geometrical uh, construction. In other words, I thought that the cylinder wrapped around the Earth was, in fact, the correct, uh, a correct description of the Mercator projection. And I'm sure the Mercator projection is known for its preservation of shapes. So I'm either mathematically incorrect, or my recollection is confused either of the properties of the Mercator projection or the method by which it's constructed geometrically. And uh, I think I would like to hear from anyone with, with an answer to this problem. I would be embarrassed if I didn't resolve this question before we tape the next show. I'm, I'm sure I'll have something on this for you by then. Like I say, it came up on me rather suddenly. I gave the problem and I thought I'd solve it. You see, I thought I remembered I hadn't solved it before. Well, I might have and I might be wrong now, but this is how it looks to me tonight. It looks to me that I've got a factor of two laterally and a factor of four vertically which does not appear to preserve shapes. It means I got a patch of territory on the Earth that looks like this, and on the Mercator projection, that I've multiplied it by 2 here, and I multiplied it by 4 here. So I'm, I'm sending it onto something like this, which is, which is not a preservation of shape. I've got a square going into a rectangle. I've got a factor 2 this way and a factor 4 that way bothers me, bothers me a lot. Think we should do a song, Neil? See, we're having a little problem with instrumentation. Now, of course, Sharon is uh, away in France, and, uh, you know, we, uh, our fans who remember when we used to have Sharon doing the harmonies uh, have uh, noticed, uh, as we are painfully aware, that the musical quality of our show has, uh, has uh, <laughs> dramatically uh, uh, gone down um, and uh, we are considering ways of uh, improving this situation it's a funny thing about seeing yourself singing on TV is it is clear that there are certain notes which I'm not uh, achieving correct intonation on I'm, I'm flat on the high notes quite uh, regularly this is a this is a distressing uh, a discovery for me I can live with it. I have to live with it, don't I? Um, I don't have to keep singing on TV, but I will, because it's math with Marty. What are we going to do? Play rhythm for me, Neil, because I think it sounds bad if, I, if you drop out a rhythm when, I, when I'm doing this okay. rink -rink, uh, organ sound. Do we have do a that. song? I like that song that was on the radio uh, 
Um, don't tell me what to do. Pretty good song. Okay. He's kind of fast to be done. We've tried and we've tried, but it's over. Yes, I didn't fit the image in your mind. And you tell me to try and find another. Well, baby, don't you think? popular on on channel 11 there's there's quite a number of shows that have country themes I notice blind Trek regularly has uh, they got this big this big big fella that does these kind of karaoke songs all the time on blind Trek. he's a real good singer boy we should get him on our show sometime he could he could uh, he could improve our total sound um, can't think of any other uh, other examples. The other thing we uh, like to keep track of, uh, we did uh, Amazing Grace a few weeks ago on, on the show, and since then I was sort of counting the fact that that song appears with uh, incredible frequency in numerous contexts, from uh, Jimmy Swaggart to, uh, to uh, The Simpsons. And uh, I saw it on some other show recently, and I was trying to recall as I came down to the studio what it was, and it eludes me. I'm getting old. Memory isn't really isn't really kicking in like it ought to. What are you going to do? There's the Mercator projection as a failure, another failure, just like the peace plan so far. We are unable to prove this uh, prove this stuff about the Mercator projection. We got a problem with that. So let's just erase it from our consciousness and go on to happier things. I really was counting on some of those Arab guys to come down and liven up the show, but uh, so math was off my mind for the last uh, week or so, and I didn't quite have the topics uh, lined up quite as regularly as I like to, but there's certain topics that are always worth uh, dragging out, topics that I, I like to think everybody knows, but of course so few people do get exposed to these things. And one of the very nice things in math is the way you can make up a square wave out of sine waves. And if you've never seen it, it's an amazing uh, 
uh, fact of uh, math, and here's how it goes. We take we take something like this, which we can think of as a wave. We like to think of a wave in time as a square wave, or you can just think of it as a picture. And all instead of thinking it as being uh, something go above zero, I'll draw the zero axis through the middle of it, so we will consider it to be symmetrical. And let's give ourselves. Damn, I'm not really drawing them very much in the middle. Let's try and make the y-axis like so. And what I want to say is that you can make this wave shape by adding together a bunch of sine waves. And here's how it goes. You start with a sine wave, and I guess it's cosine wave, strictly speaking, the way I'm doing it. You start with a cosine wave like so. And uh, <coughs> then you add to that a cosine wave, which is three times as fast, but it's one-third as big. So let's try and draw one-third here. We'll just chop this into thirds. So I want to take a wave that's a third as big, but that's three times as fast. And if I can draw that, it'll look like so. There we go. And we take this little fast moving wave and add it to the big wave. And by just techniques of straightforward graphical addition, I will suggest that the wave gets broken. See, because here they're in negative phase with each other. We've got the negative part of the wave canceling away the high part of the wave here. And here on the rising slope, they're reinforcing each other. So the net effect, and now we've got to go down just a little bit to the next uh, next line in the graph. Just give me see if possibly if we got both of them on. The net effect is to build up the wave a little bit here and chop it down a little bit over here. And this is cyclically repeated. And by taking just two sine waves of different frequencies, this single frequency and the triple frequency, and getting them precisely in the right weightings, we achieve a waveform which is already looks quite a lot more like the square wave. Now, if we continue this process by adding to this wave here, which we've, which we've synthesized, we will now add, take a wave of five times the frequency, five times the original frequency, but one-fifth the original amplitude which will look like a little wave going up and down, zip, 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 I may have exaggerated the size. And now, if I add this wave in to the composite wave we've already got, and I'll go down a graph, then it has the effect of Building it up here a little more yet, and then cutting it down and putting a few wrinkles in it. And uh, it's substantially more squared up than the way we started out with. And uh, if we continue the series, and it's quite easy to write the series, and I guess we'll go to the bottom of the board and just write it for the heck of it. Cos of x plus one-third, I think that should be a minus. Yeah, it's alternating sine. When we do it in cosine, the sine alternates. One-third cos of 3x plus one-fifth cos of 5x minus one-seventh cos of 7x to infinity. It adds up to the square, square chain of pulses. A remarkable uh, fact, uh, first suggested, I believe, by, uh, in 1750, now, who suggested it? Who suggested it, uh, that it might work out this way for certain functions, which were smooth functions, not for choppy functions? And Euler, with a great mathematician, Euler, said, 
it couldn't work for smooth functions because if it worked for smooth functions, it would work for square choppy functions like this, so it must be wrong. And it wasn't until 70 years later the J.P. Fourier had the insight to say, yes, it has to work for smooth ones, and it also has to work for the choppy ones. And it's a remarkable kind of series. It has all kinds of benefits in, in all branches of physics as a way of analyzing waves. And I think sometime we'll, we'll talk about this stuff a lot more. We seem to have been just run all out of time for the show, and I wondered, I don't think I prepared a problem well. We still have last week's problem outstanding, which is to say, for the Mercator projection, did we have the wrong definition of it, or was the proof wrong, or what the heck gives? How do we have a geometrical progression which gives the same uh, shapes for uh, whatever, whatever? That just about does it for tonight, and let's uh, take off Neil with a little bit of Wolverton Mountain. They say don't go on Wolverton Mountain if you're looking for a wife. Cause Clifton Clowers has a pretty young daughter, and he's mighty handy with a gun and a knife her tender lips are sweeter than honey and wolverton mountain protect her there the bears and the birds tell clifton flowers if a stranger should enter there all of my dreams